All right, what I have here is uh, United States District Court, Northern District of Illinois Eastern Division, United States of America versus Valerie Gaitan, plea agreement. Number one, this plea agreement between the United States Attorney for the Northern District of Illinois, John Lausch Jr., and defendant Valerie Gaitan and her attorney, Michael Clancy is made pursuant to Rule 11 of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure and is governed in part by Rule 11, as more fully set forth below. The parties to this agreement have agreed upon the following charges in this case. Number two, the indictment in this case charges defendant with money laundering, conspiracy, in violation of Title 18, United States Code, Section 1956, Count 1. Money laundering in violation of Title 18, Section 1, uh, 1956, Count 3, and engaging in a monetary transaction in criminally derived property greater than $10,000 in violation of Title 18. Um, number three, defendant has read the charges against her contained in the indictment, and those charges have been fully explained to her by her attorney. Defendant fully understands the nature and elements of the crimes with which she has been charged. Charge to which defendant is pleading guilty. By this plea agreement, by this plea agreement, defendant agrees to enter a voluntary plea of guilty to the following count of the indictment. Count one, which charges the de defendant with money laundering conspiracy. Uh, so she she copped to the uh, she pleaded guilty to the conspiracy charge, money laundering conspiracy. Factual basis. Number six, defendant will plead guilty because she is, in fact, guilty of the charge contained in count one of the indictment. In pleading guilty, defendant admits the following facts and that those facts establish her guilt beyond a reasonable doubt and establish a basis for forfeiture of the property described elsewhere in this plea agreement. Beginning no later than in or about December 2008 and continuing until at least on or about March 11, 2020 at Chicago in the Northern District of Illinois Eastern Division and elsewhere, defendant Valerie Gaitan did conspire with Viviana Lopez, Armando Flores, and others to commit an offense in violation of Title 18, to knowingly conduct and attempt to conduct a financial transaction affecting interstate commerce, which involved the proceeds of a specified unlawful activity that is the felonious buying and selling and otherwise dealing in a controlled substance, knowing that the transaction was designed in whole and in part to conceal and disguise the nature, location, source, ownership and control of the proceeds of said specified unlawful activity and that while conducting and attempting to conduct such financial transaction knew that the property involved in this financial transaction represented the proceeds of some form of unlawful activity aka y'all was playing around with dope money and we don't like it to knowingly engage in a monetary transaction in and affecting interstate commerce and criminally derived property of a value greater than $10,000. Such property having been derived from a specified unlawful activity, namely the felonious buying and selling and otherwise dealing in a controlled substance in violation of Title 18. More specifically, in or about 2008, Gaitan was living in Mexico with other family members which including her husband Margarito Flores, or Margarito, her brother-in-law Pedro Flores, or Pedro, Pedro's wife Viviana Lopez, or Viviana, and her other brother-in-law Armando Flores, or Armando. Between at least May 2005 and December 2008, Margarito and Pedro operated a Chicago-based distribution cell for the Sinaloa Cartel and the Beltran Leva organization, which involved the transportation and distribution of hundreds of kilograms of brocaine and kilogram quantities of share when per month to customers in Columbus, Cincinnati, Chicago, Philadelphia, New York, Washington, D.C., Detroit, Los Angeles, and Vancouver. This rug trafficking activity generated hundreds of millions of dollars of proceeds from the sale of narcotics. In or about November 2008, Margarito, Pedro, and Armando began cooperating with the United States government, which ultimately caused them and their families to leave Mexico and return to the United States 
in or about December 2008. In or about August 2010, Gaetan and Viviana turned in approximately $4.2 million in cash rug proceeds to counsel for Margarito for the purpose of forfeit, forfeiting the proceeds to the government. All right, y'all remember, Jay said clearly <clears throat> that uh, when they started testifying or when they when you know when they got brought in, they had to turn over 4.2 million. So that's that 4.2 million uh, that Val and Vivi turned in on behalf of P and J. At the time, Gaetan and others turned in these funds. Gaetan and others represented that the 4.2 million to constitute all of the available rug proceeds remaining from the rug operation of Margarito and Pedro. All right, so I guess that says that at the time they were saying the 4.2 million was it. So all y'all had left, huh? I'm sure there's a lot of other aspects involved that would make it that number specifically, especially the amount of loads that they gave up at the end and the amount of money that they had out there owed to people after they started their cooperation, if that makes sense. However, in reality, additional rug proceeds remained available to Gaitan. In or about 2010 or 2011, Gaitan arrived at Armando's home in the Austin, Texas area around the same time that a U-Haul truck filled with second-hand furniture arrived. Gaitan was aware that the truck contained bulk cash, which Gaitan understood to be rug proceeds hidden inside the furniture. Gaitan asked Armando, I should just call her uh, Val, um, asked Armando if he could store the cash for her. Armando agreed and proceeded to bury the money underneath his back porch. Val acknowledges that the cash rug proceeds totaled at least approximately $2.3 million, million. dollars. So that's $2.3 under the back porch. Just turned over $4.2. Armando stored the cash rug proceeds from Val for a number of years without accessing it. Beginning in or about 2015, Armando agreed to start dispersing the cash as directed by Val in exchange for a fee. At Val's request, Armando dispersed the money in different ways, all of which Val knew were designed to conceal the illegal nature and source of the money. So they're saying everything that she did and everything that he did was in an attempt to hide that bread. You know what I'm saying? In an attempt to hide that bread. But they're not just hiding that bread from the feds. They're hiding that bread from wolves, too. My question is, all right, they turned it over to you and said, what, that's it? Just the 4.2? Y'all didn't think about that, that there was nothing else? Nothing else? The feds didn't see nothing else? Because the ladies made it clear. They said, and again, they took their, uh, you know, they took it on the chin. They went to prison. You know, but, their, but their claim is that, man, we, first of all, we had have, we have some immunity. That's number one. And number two, we claimed this money. We already put this out there. They didn't want no part of this money. They just wanted their testimonies. Here we go. Uh, Armando dispersed the money in different ways, all of which Val knew were designed to conceal the illegal nature and source of the money. For example, between approximately one and four times per month, from approximately 2015 to 2020, Armando sent quantities of cash rug proceeds via U.S. Mail Priority Express to Val at her home or at a UPS store mailbox held under the name of Val's family member. The amount of rug proceeds Armando sent in these parcels varied, but on average, the parcels contained at least nine grand per mailing. I mean, that's, that's to keep it from being reported if you drop it anywhere, I guess. But if it's cash, you ain't dropping it anywhere. Val acknowledges that in approximately 2016 and 2017, Armando started to sometimes ex exchange older, dirty currency that was often in small denominations for new $100 bills at a nearby gas station currency exchange where Armando knew an employee before then sending the money to Gaetan by mail. I feel like we read this. They must have used this in one of the articles that we read. Armando also distributed the cash rug proceeds for Val by delivering the proceeds to a travel agency near Armando's home in order to pay for travel that Val booked for herself and others. Val told Armando the approximate amount of cash to bring to the travel agency, and then when Armando was inside the agency, he would 
call Val via a prepaid cell phone, which Armando used to communicate with Val regarding the rug proceeds, and let Val speak with the travel agency employee for purposes of booking the travel and also determining the final amount of money that was due. Val would then have Armando pay the employee that final amount using the cash rug proceeds. Right? They were spending that bread. Gotta spend that, gotta spend that bread. In addition... Armando used the cash rug proceeds to buy and mail out money orders and gift cards at Val's direction. Armando at times also used his own credit or debit cards to pay for Val's expenses and then reimbursed himself, plus a fee. With the cash rug proceeds he stored for Val, with the, with the cash rug proceeds he stored for Val. This arrangement between Armando and Val continued until on or about March 9th, 2020. Finally, Val acknowledges that on or about June 11, 2019, Gaitan and Viviana knowingly caused approximately $10,307.43 in rug proceeds possessed by Viviana to be used to purchase airfare for Val. Viviana and their relatives, for airfare for Val, Viviana and their relatives at a travel agency in Chicago. So basically, y'all was moving around money as far as they're concerned. Y'all was sneaking around, spending that bread all willy-nilly. And uh, now you know what it is. Number se- uh, Maximum statutory penalties. Number seven, defendant understands that the charge to which she is pleading guilty carries the following statutory pl- penalties. A maximum sentence of 20 years imprisonment. This offense also carries a maximum fine of $500,000 or twice the property involved. Whichever is greater. Defendant further understands that the judge also may impose a term of supervised release of not more than three years. So remember, they tried to give them 11 and a half years. They tried to give them 11 and a half years and ended up, they ended up getting three and a half. But it has a maximum sentence of 20 years on that case, supposedly. Uh, B, pursuant to Title 18... Defendant will be assessed $100 on the charge to which she to which she has pled guilty in addition to any uh, other penalty imposed, all right? So they hit her in the head for another $100, however that goes, you know what I mean? All right, sentencing guideline ca- calculations. Number eight, defendant understands that in determining a sentence, the court is obligated to calculate the applicable sentencing guidelines range. And to consider that range, possible departures under the sentencing guidelines and other sentencing factors under 18, which include the nature and circumstance of the offense and the history and characteristics of the defendant, the need for the sentence imposed to reflect the seriousness of the offense, promote respect for the law, and provide just punishment for the offense. So how dare you guys move that money around? You had no respect for us, and we're going to make sure when we sentence you that we show everybody that you should respect the law, all right, and provide just punishment for the offense, afford adequate deterrence to criminal conduct, protect the public from further crimes of the defendant, and provide the defendant with needed educational or vocational training, medical care, or other correctional treatment in the most effective manner. Last thing that prisons do is correct people just doesn't work that way the kinds of sentences available the need to avoid unwarranted sentence disparities among defendants with similar records who have been found guilty of similar conduct and the need to provide restitution to any victim of the offense nine for purposes of calculating the sentencing guidelines the parties agree on the following points except as specified below a applicable guidelines the sentencing guidelines to be considered in this case are those in effect at the same uh, those in effect at the time of sentencing the following statements regarding the calculation of the sentencing guidelines are based on the guidelines manual currently in effect namely the november 2021 guidelines manual uh, offense level calculations the base offense level is 24 pursuant to guideline whatever because the value of the laundered funds is greater than 1.5 million but less than 3.5 million so that, that assigns that number, how much money was involved in this laundering. Number two is six levels are added pursuant to the guideline because the defendant knew that the laundered funds were the proceeds of an offense involving the manufacture, importation, or distribution of a controlled substance. All right, So add six to that 24 just because they knew where that money came from, that it was 
quote unquote dirty money, right? Bet. Three, two levels are added to the offense pursuant to the guideline because the defendant was convicted. All right. So add two just because we found you guilty. And then number four, it's it's the government's position that four levels are added to the offense level because the defendant was an organizer of a criminal activity that involved five or more participants or was otherwise extensive. It is defendant's position that this enhancement does not apply. So Val was against them using this guideline. Both parties reserved the right to present evidence and argue on this issue at sentencing. So they tried to give her the boss status. The same boss status we was talking about with uh, with Buddy. Ron Ron. Yep, they try, to, they try to make her one of the bosses. Five, defendant has clearly demonstrated a recognition and affirmative acceptance of personal responsibility for his criminal conduct, for her criminal conduct. If the government does not receive additional evidence in conflict with this provision... And if ever and if defendant continues to accept responsibility for her actions within the meaning of the guideline, the probation office, uh, including by furnishing the United States Attorney's Office and the probation office with all requested financial information relevant to her abilities to satisfy any fine that may be imposed in this case. A two-level reduction in the offense level is appropriate. This is like a game. It's like a, a silly game of points. You know what I'm saying? If you did this, you get these points. If you didn't do this, we'll take two points away. If you argue this, we'll add three points. Listen here, man. Uh, number six. And according with the guidelines, defendant has timely notified the government of her intentions to enter a plea of guilty, thereby permitting the government to avoid preparing for trial and permitting the court to allocate its resources efficiently. Therefore, as provided by the guideline, the court determines the offense to be, uh, uh, if the court determines the, the offense level to be 16 or greater prior to determining that defendant is entitled to a two-level reduction for acceptance and responsibility, the government will move for an additional one-level reduction in the offense level. As long as you notify them in, in in enough time that you're gonna plead guilty and you're not gonna make them go through all the business of getting ready for court they'll take they'll take one point away <laughs> they negotiate with their points you know what i'm saying because the law is so serious you can negotiate with all these points criminal history category with regard to determining the defendant's criminal history points and criminal history category based on the facts now known to the government and stipulated below defendant's criminal history points equals zero and defendant's criminal history category is one. I, on or about October 1st, 2001, defendant was convicted of structuring in the United States District Court for the Northern District of Illinois and sentenced, uh, of Illinois and sentenced to five months imprisonment. Pursuant to guideline, uh, defendant received zero criminal history points for this conviction. So that was when she, that's, that's that 2001 case. I think that's when they try to get her to wear the wire on K. D, anticipated advisory sentencing guidelines range. Therefore, based on the facts now known to the government, it is the government's position that the anticipated offense level is 33, which when combined with the anticipated criminal history category of 1, results in an anticipated advisory sentencing range of 135 to 168 month imprisonment, in addition to any supervised release and fine the court may impose. It is defendant's position that the anticipated offense level is 29, which when combined with the anticipated criminal history category of 1, results in an anticipated advisory sentencing guideline range of 87 to 101 months. While in. In addition to any supervised release and fine the court may impose. So being that her, she received zero criminal history points for this conviction, and she's at level 1, they're saying that could have got up to 87 to 108 months. E, defendant and her attorney and the government acknowledge that the above guideline calculations are preliminary in nature and are non-binding, meaning we can screw you later if we want to. So yeah, defendant and her attorney and the government acknowledge that the above guideline calculations are preliminary in nature. We'll get you later. And are non-binding predictions upon which neither party is entitled to rely. 
Defendants understand that further review of the facts or applicable legal principles may lead the government to conclude that different or additional guidelines provisions apply in this case. The defendant understands that the probation office will conduct its own investigation and that the court ultimately determines the facts and law relevant to sentencing and that the court's determination governs the final guideline calculation accordingly. The validity of this agreement is not contingent upon the probation officers or the court's concurrence with the above calculations and defendants shall not have a right to withdraw her plea on the basis of the court's rejection of these calculations. In other words, you stuck. Number 10, both parties expressly acknowledge that this agreement is not governed by uh, Fed or Crim and the errors in applying or interpreting any of the sentencing guidelines may be corrected by either par party prior to sentencing. The parties may correct these er errors either by stipulation or by a statement to the probation officer of the court, setting forth the disagreement Regarding the applicable provisions of the guidelines, the, val the validity of this agreement will not be affected by such corrections and defendants shall not have a right to withdraw her plea. Everything is you cannot withdraw your plea. We got you. Nor the government the right to vacate this agreement on the basis of such corrections. Agreement relating to the sentencing. Each party is free to recommend whatever sentence it deems appropriate. 12. It is understood by the parties that the sentencing judge is either a party to nor bound by this agreement and may impose a sentence up to the maximum penalties as set forth above. Defendant further acknowledges that if the court does not accept the sentencing recommendations of the parties, the defendant will have no right to withdraw her plea agreement. Defendant agrees to pay the special assignment of $100. After sentence has been imposed on the count to which defendant pleads guilty as agreed herein, the government will move to dismiss the remaining count of the indictment as to defendant. Forfeiture. They love this part. Defendant understands that by pleading guilty, she will be subject to forfeiture to the United States, to forfeiture to the United States, all right, title, and interest that she has in any property involved in the offense. Defendant agrees to, to the entry of a personal money judgment in the amount of $504,858, which represents property involved in the offense. Defendant consents to the immediate entry of a preliminary order of forfeiture setting forth the amount of personal money judgment she'll be ordered to pay. Like, what's up with these fines, man? What happens when you don't pay these fines? Where do they expect somebody to pull a, 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 a half a million out their pocket? Defendant admits that because the directly forf forfeitable property is no longer available for forfeiture as described in Title 21, the United States is entitled to seek forfeiture of any other property of the defendant up to the value of the personal money judgment as substitute assets pursuant to title 21 man they could just take it all jack you defendant understands that forfeiture shall not be treated as satisfaction of any fine cost or aka you're gonna keep giving you keep giving you keep giving we keep taking we keep taking and uh don't ask no questions you know what i'm saying and which is y'all mad because you feel like they did that you feel like the girls took, 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 took. But that's the government. The government, you ain't nothing but a cartel, man. Defendant agrees to waive all constitutional, statutory, and equitable challenges in any manner, including but not limited to direct appeal or a motion brought under the Title 28 to any forfeiture carried out in accordance with this agreement or on any grounds, including that the forfeiture constitutes an excessive fine or punishment. The waiver in this paragraph does not apply to a claim of involuntariness or ineffective assistance of counsel. Acknowledgements and waivers regarding plea of guilty. Nature of agreement. This agreement is entirely voluntary and represents the entire agreement between the United States Attorney and the defendant regarding the defendant's criminal liabil liability. This agreement concerns criminal liability only, except as expressly yet forth, set forth in the agreement Nothing herein shall co constitute a limitation, waiver, or release by the United States or any of its agencies of any administrative or judicial civil claim, demand, or cause of action it may have against defendant or any other person or entity. The obligations of this agreement are limited to the U.S. State's Attorney for the Northern District of Illinois and cannot bind any other federal, state, or local prosecuting, administrative, or regulatory authorities except as expressly set forth in the agreement. 
conditional plea of guilty. The government agrees that defendant's plea of guilty is entered pursuant to Fedar Krim. Pursuant to that rule, the parties agree that defendant with the consent of the court may enter a conditional plea of guilty, reserving her right to appeal to the courts of November 8th, uh, the court's order of November 8th, 2022, denying defendant's motion to dismiss. Only the in the event of a reversal of the decision will defendants be permitted to withdraw her plea. The government does not consent to an appeal on any other pretrial issue and defendant reserves the right to appeal only the identified pretrial ruling and any issues relating to the sentence. Defendant acknowledges that in the event of a reversal of the court's order denying the motion to dismiss, the government may reinstate and prosecute any charges. AKA, we're all done here, but if we decide we're not all done here, we are gonna come back and get you and you know, see if we can get some more done. You know what I mean? Wilding. It's just nasty. Nasty work. Um, same old shit right there. Waiver of rights. Defendant understands that by pleading guilty, she surrenders certain rights, including the following. Trial rights. Defendant has the right to persist in the plea of not guilty to the charges against her. And if she does, she would have the right to a public and speedy trial. The trial could be either a jury trial or a trial by the judge sitting without a jury. However, in order that the trial be conducted by the judge sitting without a jury, defendant, the government, and the judge all must agree that the trial be conducted by the judge without a jury. If the trial is a jury trial, the jury would be composed of 12 citizens from the district selected at random. Defendant and her attorney would participate in choosing the jury by requesting that the court remove prospective jurors for cause where actual bias or other disqualification is shown, or by removing prospective jurors without cause by exercising uh, peremp peremptory challenges. The trial is a jury by trial. The jury would be instructed that the defendant is presumed innocent, that the government has the bur burden of proving defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, and that the jury could not convict her unless, after hearing all of the evidence, it was persuaded of her guilt by a reasonable doubt and it was considered to each count of the indictment separately. The jury would have to agree unanimously as to each count before it could return a verdict of guilty or not guilty. The trial is held by the judge without a jury. The judge would find the facts and determine. Either way, you're screwed. You know what I'm saying? All it takes is a couple of haters in the jury. So, you know, people don't like the way you look, how you walk, how you talk, whatever. Or a judge that woke up on the wrong side of the bed. Pre-sentence investigation report, post-sentence supervision. Defendant understands that the United States Attorney in its submission to the probation office as a part of the pre-sentence report and that sentencing shall fully apprise the district court and the probation office of the nature, scope, and extent of defendant's conduct regarding the charges against her and related matters. The government will make known all matters in aggravation and mitigation relevant to the sentencing. Defendant agrees to truthfully and completely execute a financial statement with supporting documents Prior to sentencing, the United States Attorney's Office regarding all details of her financial circumstances, including her recent income tax returns, as specified by the probation officer. They want it all. I want everything. Give me your lunch money. Give me your lunch money. You ain't getting no Uber. Get on that bike. You don't need a new car. We need that. Run that. Defender understands that providing false or incomplete information or refusing to provide this information may be used as a basis for denial of a reduction for acceptance of responsibility pursuant to the guideline and an enhancement and enhancement of her sentence for obstruction of justice and may be prosecuted as violation of the code for the purpose of monitoring the defendant's comp compliance with her obligations to pay a fine during any term of supervised release or probation to which defendant is sentenced defendant further consents to the disclosure by the IRS to the probation office and the United States office of it's like you'll never be able to spend a dollar again Without them seeing where that dollar went, who it went to, how it got to you, who taxed it, how many times it was taxed, and how many times, how much is still there that can still be taxed. You know what I mean? It's crazy. So they they even want to know they they they're all in your IRS. I mean, they could already get all in your IRS shit, but now they want you to now they want you to serve it up. You know what I mean? They don't want to have to just look for it. You tell us so that when we do go looking and we find something, we are gonna come knock your ass down. That's what they on. You know, they wildin'.
Defendant also agrees that a certified copy of this agreement shall be sufficient evidence of defendant request to the IRS to disclose the returns and return information as provided for in Title 26, United States Code, Section 6103. Other terms. Defendant agrees to cooperate with the United States Attorney's Office in collecting any unpaid fine for which the defendant is liable, including providing financial statements and supporting uh, records as requested by the United States Attorney's Office. Defendant understands that if convicted, a defendant who is not a United States citizen may be removed from the United States, denied citizenship, and denied admission to the United States in the future. Conclusion. Defendant understands that this agreement will be filed with the court will become a matter of public record and may be disclosed to any person. Number 10, defendant understands that her compliance with each part of this agreement extends throughout the period of her sentence and failure to abide by any of the terms of the agreement is a violation of the agreement. Defendant further understands that in the event she violates this agreement, the government at its option, right there is at its option, at its option is just like in perpetuity, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's... Whenever we feel like it, for however long we feel like it, forever. Agreement the government at its option may move to vacate the agreement, rendering it null and void. And thereafter prosecute defendant not subject to any of the limits set forth in this agreement. Or may move to resentence defendant or require defendant's specific performance of this agreement. Defendant understands and agrees that in the event that the court permits defendant to withdraw from this agreement or defendant breaches any of its terms and the government elects to void the agreement and prosecute defendant, any prosecutions that are not time barred by the applicable statute of limitations on the date of the signing of this agreement may be commenced against defendant in accordance with this paragraph, notwithstanding the expiration of the statute of limitations between the signing of this agreement and the commencement of such prosecutions. 11. Should the judge refuse to accept the defendant's plea of guilty, this agreement shall become null, null and void and neither party will be bound to it. Number 12. Defendant and her attorney acknowledge that no threats, promises, or representations have been made nor agreements reached other than those set forth in this agreement to cause defendant to plead guilty. So she wasn't pressed. AKA, we didn't press her. Number 13. Defendant acknowledges that she has read this agreement and carefully reviewed each provision with their attorney. Defendant further acknowledges she understands and voluntarily accepts each and every term and condition of this agreement. 4.2 million turned in, 2.3 played with, and uh, could have been worse. But it's, it's pretty bad, but it could have been worse. Because the way you look at these sentencing levels, whew, definitely levels to it. Again, I think it's unjust that they're in there for the time that they're in. Uh, people with real cases and real charges involved in this whole scenario stopped in to the joint, had a cup of coffee, and bounced.